Okay, well, thank you everyone who's able to join us today. Our speaker for today's webinar is Dr. Hadas Kotek, who's a syntactician, semanticist, semanticist and uh, experimental linguist, uh, who has an affiliated research position at MIT, where she also received her PhD in linguistics. Uh, since then, uh, Hadas has worked as a postdoctoral fellow at McGill University and also held teaching positions at NYU and Yale. Her presentation today is on an ongoing collaborative project working with many other people, I think she'll mention in her presentation, so I won't try to list all the names, uh, on the topic of gender representation in constructed example sentences. So welcome, Hadas. Thank you for taking the time to join us and share uh, your work with us. Look forward to hearing what you have to share. As mentioned, we'll keep our microphones and cameras off. We'll be listening intently, even though it may not seem like we're here during your presentation. And then we'll uh, save the last uh, 10 or 15 minutes of this hour together for questions and responses. You can ask your question by writing it in the chat or by raising your hand. And then I'll, at the end, ask you to uh, unmute, turn off your, turn on your camera so you can um, ask your question. So with that, let me hand it over to Hadas and looking forward to uh, what you have to share. All right, thank you for this introduction and thank you for inviting me. Um, I should also point out that some of my co-authors are also present here in this, um, on this call. And so if you ask questions in the chat, you might actually get quite quick answers to your questions. Um, and I may refer some of the difficult questions specifically to them, so we shall see. Uh, let me share my screen and um, apologize in advance for noises in the background. Those would be my cats going crazy. Um, you may have already seen one of them. Um, okay. So hopefully I'm sharing my screen. Looks good. And hopefully I'm fine in full screen mode. It doesn't get stuck, but tell me if it is. Um, can you see me go to the next page? Okay, yep, cool. All set. So, um, all right. So I'm going to get started. Um, what I'm going to be reporting on today is a project that um, has inspired um, three papers that are related to one another and um, has been done in collaboration with two separate groups of um, colleagues, co-authors. The first part, um, which I will actually go over kind of briefly because I want to spend more time on the second half, um, but this part is uh, done with a group of committee members of, uh, from the committee, the LSA Committee on, the, uh, on Gender Equity and Linguistics. Um, Coggle, this is um, a new name change. We used to be called Coswell, the Committee on the Status of Women in Linguistics. Um, and this is a picture of us presenting um, from a few years ago, back when you could you know, travel to conferences and present. Um, but that earlier work uh, inspired the work that, would be, that will be the main part of what I will talk about today. Um, and that part is a collaboration with three Yale graduate students, um, or former graduate students by now. Um, I'll say more about precisely how we uh, build on and expand that. Um, and all three of them, Ricker, um, Sierra, and Chris, are on this um, call today, So, um, which I'm very happy to see. And hopefully, they can help me um, and help you make sense of everything that I'm saying. So let me start by giving a bit of a broader background for this talk and this uh, topic and why we're interested in it. So in, in 1996, the um, Linguistic Society of America publishes what, it's, what it calls the Guidelines for Non-Sexist Usage. And this is its first attempt to write down and give guidelines for, um, for how to be inclusive with respect to gender um, in uh, writing that relates to linguistics. And around the same time in 1997, Macaulay and Bryce publish a paper in language that is an analysis of 11 syntax textbooks that were published between 69 and 94, so quite a range. And they conclude that the majority of constructed example sentences in syntax textbooks are biased toward male gendered noun phrases and contained highly stereotyped representations of both genders. Um, and then 20 years later, together with my colleagues from Coggle, we um, conduct a similar study and report on similar results from six syntax textbooks that were published more recently, so between 2005 and 2017. I'll say more about both of these uh, studies a bit in a bit. Um, 
Before I move on, though, I want to say right now that uh, we do recognize that bi gender is not a binary and that people who identify um, outside of the gender binary may or may not even adopt gendered language to refer to themselves. And furthermore, that this has nothing to do with the sex that they were assigned at birth. And so you will see us talking about gender as if it is a binary in this talk, and that is a limitation of our study. We've spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I'm happy to say more about this toward the end of the talk in the Q&A. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to um, think about how to do better, but I want to flag that um, just because we say male and female um, and kind of ignore additional complexities does not mean that we don't recognize that those both exist and are really important. Okay, <clears throat> so what I want to spend the majority of my time today on is a study of gender representation in example sentences in journal papers that were published between 1997 and 2018 in three leading theoretical linguistics journals, um, and those are language, linguistic theory, inquiry, and natural language and linguistic theory. And specifically, the question we wanted to address was whether the bias that has been observed in syntax textbooks extends beyond this limited genre and into research, into scholarly work in linguistics uh, broadly. And we will show you that the answer is yes, and once we get that far, then we want to know what can we do about that? How can we improve? So here's my plan for today. Um, I'll spend a bit of time, um, we've done the introduction, I'll spend a bit of time talking about um, gender in uh, gender representation in textbooks, um, covering both the Macaulay and Bryce paper and my collaboration with a uh, subcommittee, subpart of the Cargo Committee. <clears throat> and then I spent the majority of my time talking about gender representation in journal papers, and then um, discuss both why this matters and how we can try to improve on the status, the situation that we will show you. So. All right, let's, let's dive into textbook um, example sentences. Okay, so Macaulay and Bryce, 1997, um, is a comparative study of constructed example sentences from 11 syntax textbooks that were published between 69 and 94, where the first part was a close investigation of one specific textbook and once some uh, skews in the representation of gender were found in that one study, um, the study that we're really interested in is this um, expansion, this additional study that looked at 10 additional textbooks and um, tried to investigate whether this is something general or maybe it just happened to be that they picked one book that um, had issues but this wasn't a general issue. So. All right, so for this more uh, larger study that looked at 10 syntax textbooks, um, what Macaulay and Bryce did was sample 200 examples from each of these textbooks and find, identify all of the noun phrases in those examples and then code them, um, assign them labels uh, for a variety of factors of interest. And so um, the first one is grammatical gender, um, which could be female or male. Um, grammatical functions, so something can be a subject, it can be a direct object, it can be an indirect object, um, and maybe there are a few other uh, more minor types of functions um, that one could um, imagine, but these are the main ones. Um, theta roles, so these are um, kind of semantic relations, so um, is the um, noun phrase um, an agent of an action, is it a patient, so having an action kind of um, acted upon it, is it an experiencer? So is it is it kind of experiencing something, but nothing really is changing in the world? Is it a recipient? Is it um, a goal? There are a few other, um, but these are um, these are the big ones. Um, and then another um, factor of, of interest is just general lexical choices in the example. So um, is there a pronoun, or is there a proper name, or does the sentence describe violence, or does it describe someone's appearance, or is it about reading and writing? Um, and a few other of these kinds of choices. Okay, um, so I'm gonna kind of, to, in the interest of time, just kind of tell you what the results are and kind of not show you numbers for any of these, at least in this part of the talk. So, um, so here are um, the main findings from Macaulay and Bryce. Um, so they identify that men occur more often in, as arguments 
generally than women do. They are more likely to be subjects and agents than women. They have proper names and pronouns more often than women. They engage in intellectual activity, so that basically means they are the ones who read and write books, um, and they appear in car-related events more often than women do. They are described as having occupations more often than women, and um, they have a broader range of occupations, so they just they do more things. And they engage in violence more often than women. On the other hand, women are referred to using kinship terms more often than men are. So they're someone's wife or mother. Those are the two uh, most common ones. Um, and they have their appearances described more often than men do. So here are a few examples of what we mean by that. I'm not going to read all of these, but I will read a few of them. Um, so um, every painting of Maya and photograph of Debbie pleased Ben. Harry watches the fights and his wife the soap operas. Um, Bill is proud of his father and tired of his mother. Um, John might drown some selection of arguments um, that vary in some ways. I will not read all of them. Uh, Stephen likes, but Maya hates, the man next door. We consider him to be a genius and her to be a fool. Um, I'm going to just kind of highlight, let you look at the other ones. I'm going to take um, maybe 15 seconds to uh, drink my coffee over here. And uh, as an exercise to the reader, uh, pick one and um, try to imagine what syntactic property it shows that um, this needs to show, right? That another example couldn't show. Or just, uh, yep, I will pause for a few seconds. Okay, um, I have more examples to show you. Um, in addition to these, um, you know, stereotypical examples, maybe, we also find, or Macaulay and Bryce also find, explicit and suggestive language in examples. So um, again, I, I definitely will not read all of these. Some of these are, I, I don't want to read them. Um, but here's, here are a few. So what a nice pair Mary's got, where pair is a uh, wordplay on pair, P-A-I-R. Um, John forced Mary to be kissed by Bill. Um, he wants glonked and out of work actress. Um, not reading most of these. Um, she's fond of John naked. Um, this is my favorite. Uh, I'm not going to read this last one, uh, but um, again, as an exercise to um, everyone on this call, um, what is this showing? <laughs> well, why is this here? Um, there is an answer, but once we have that, we could possibly come up with a better example for why this is here, um, and in particular, um, it's not completely obvious that the um, explicit language here is necessary. Okay. So, um, kind of summing up, Macaulay and Bryce comments, um, our results clearly illustrate the need for such scrutiny. So they're trying to explain why they're conducting the study because they have been getting pushback on um, is there is this real and do we need this, right? So they say, females are simply not significant actors in the world constructed by sample sentences. And we want to point out that neither are non-binary individuals. They are not even discussed. But that was uh, almost 25 years ago. And so one wonders, is that still really the case now? Um, so to foreshadow, the answer is going to be yes. Um, and to kind of show you how the answer is still yes in the context of textbooks. I want to, again, briefly talk about my study with um, the um, other committee members of um, COGO, the Committee on Gender Equity and Linguistics. Um, so we looked at six, six, um, six syntax textbooks that were published between 2005 and 2017. And we used the same factors of interest as Macaulay and Bryce. Um, in our study. And again, just showing you major findings um, and skipping graphs, but you can ask me to show you graphs if you're curious. 
Um, we found a total of um, 1,200 or so gendered arguments. And of those, um, we had a ratio of um, two to one male to female arguments. So 34% of our arguments were female and the rest were male, right? So this is, um, I think, a significant skew in total numbers. And we furthermore find that it is consistent across all of the books that we looked at, and it is consistent regardless of the language of example. So this is something we were interested in that Macaulay and Bryce did not control for. So we were curious about whether the skew is um, contributed by um, data from other languages. So in, in particular, if the author is reliant on someone else's research and someone else's research is biased, maybe that's why they're forced in a sense to pick um, biased arguments or biased sentences. Um, and we find that that's probably not um, at least not the full story, because um, this is true in English, it is true in, in French, it is true in German, it is true in, in regardless of what language we were looking at. Okay, um, so a quick summary again. Um, so men still appear more often as arguments than um, women do. They're still more likely to be subjects and agents. They still engage in intellectual activities like book reading or writing or handling more often. They are still described as having occupations more often, and they still have a broader range of occupations. And they engage in more violence than women, and when you look at the actual predicates, you discover that the violence is more severe when men engage in it than when, than women, when women engage in it. Okay, um, some things have improved, so that's uh, worth saying. Uh, some ratios did improve between the earlier study, Macaulay and Bryce, and, and this work. Uh, one thing that's important, really important, I think, to point out, and we can talk about later, is that the actual explicit content is basically gone. We, we could find in our entire study three such examples. So uh, basically almost none. Um, we don't see discussions of women's appearances. We don't see discussions of women pleasing men. Um, again, sexually explicit, suggestive language, all of those things just are not there. Um, we also don't see examples um, concerning men and cars. That's absent too. But all of the major findings from Macaulay and Bryce are still the same. So we still see this big skew in the choices that authors make about who is um, a subject or another subject, who is an agent, an experiencer, or a patient, so having an action acted on them, um, who is described as being a genius, who is described as reading books, who um, is described as being a professor or um, a teacher or um, you know a CEO or um, a secretary and so on. In addition, we try to find um, non-gendered or gender-neutral um, names. In particular, we were interested in that. Um, so, looking at names, we find that in fact um, very few are gender-neutral. So. Um, there isn't an apparent effort to uh, make examples uh, non-biased, at least in this way. Um, and again, explicit discussions of uh, non-binary gender identities are um, just absent from these textbooks that we were looking at. Okay, so um, this is a lot of background on the state of example sentences in textbooks. Um, I want to move on to talking about journal papers, and this is where I'll spend uh, more time showing you um, breakdowns of numbers, and I'll show you graphs, um, and um, again, I guess we're not taking questions during this talk, but um, feel free to uh, kind of comment in the chat or ask questions if anything is not clear. So um, to put this in a broader context, um, textbooks are a very specific genre, and so we want to know if this is um, indicative or um, illustr illustrative of linguistic research more generally. Um, and so to answer that question, what we did was um, take three journals um, in theoretical linguistics, um, and those are linguistic inquiry, natural language and linguistic theory, and language, um, and extract all of the papers from those three journals um, that were published between the years 97 and uh, 2018, so 97 being the year that Macaulay and Bryce was published, um, and 2018 being the year that we started doing the study. Um, in total, this gave us uh, 927 papers and um, about 25,000 third-person human or animate um, arguments, and so hopefully um, this 
is a quite a large data set and should allow us to be quite confident about any conclusions that we draw. Um, to say a bit more, so now it doesn't make sense anymore to, um, to we, we can't sample again and so we can't, um, we can't use the same kind of methodology that the previous work did um, since their numbers were much smaller. So instead what we did was we extracted examples from papers using regular expressions. So um, these are kind of formulas you can write to identify uh, patterns in text. So um, example sentences are convenient in that they all look the same. Um, so you know there, uh, there's going to be a parenthesis and then some numbers and then another parenthesis and then it's going to, the, num the text is going to be removed from the margin. Um, so we can write, um, kind of a rule to try to identify all of those um, examples. Um, this does mean that we're not looking at any example sentences that are just in the text. We, we just, there is no good way to find those, so we're not looking at those. Um, but again, it gives us 25,000 examples, so hopefully that's um, a, a large enough sample to be quite confident about. Um, we're interested generally in the same properties as these two previous papers. Um, there are a couple others I will show you um, later that we did a little bit differently. Um, and now, uh, instead of doing all of this work ourselves, uh, we um, hired um, a small army of, of Yale undergraduate students to, uh, to do this work for us. So we uh, taught them how to identify these properties of interest. Right? So um, is an argument a subject? Is it uh, a recipient? Um, is there eye of violence here? So we defined the factors of interest um, and we had them do the work with one of us, at least one of us, um, making sure, doing quality control, making sure that uh, things look good. Um, we also did some things um, automatically, so not um, with uh, humans assigning labels. Um, so for example, for looking at emotions, we could do sentiment analysis. Um, and in some cases, again, we could use regular expressions. So for example, for kinship terms, the list of kinship terms is not very large. We could just try to construct a list and identify all of those uh, tokens. Okay, so um, let me now um, go into a section of the talk where I show you lots of graphs and numbers. Um, and here's the first one. So this is just the overall distributions of um, subjects and uh, objects. So all arguments, I should say, in, uh, in the papers that we saw. So um, we find, uh, so we're kind of identifying here female arguments, male arguments, and ambiguous or non-gendered arguments. So those could be um, things like the student um, when there isn't a pronoun or some other way to, uh, or a gender agreement or some other way to identify that it's gendered. Um, it can be a name that could be ambiguous like uh, Taylor, for example. And so we find that um, of the gendered arguments, which the majority of the talk will uh, just look at those, uh, we'll compare the female arguments and the male arguments. Um, there is a two, to one, a bit more than two to one, male to female um, ratio. Right? So for every one female argument in example sentences, there are two, more than two male arguments. Right? And furthermore, we can also look at um, how this has changed over time. And so here's um, one way to look at that. So we're looking at um, over time on the way X axis, um, and um, the ratio of female to male arguments on the y axis. So what you're seeing here is um, a trend toward a slight improvement. And if you kind of squint at the actual graph, you see that it's an improvement from roughly 0.3 to roughly 0.33 or maybe 3.4. So not a huge increase, but an increase. But once you break out this increase into subject and non-subject arguments separately, in fact, what you find is that there has been a slight de decrease in the number of female subjects over time in example sentences and an increase in non-subject arguments um, that are female over time. So that slight trend toward an increase that we were seeing on the previous slide um, really is contributed by an increase in the numbers of non or proportions of non-subject non arguments, right? which, um, I don't know, is, is a bit discouraging. Okay. Um, so next, I want to show you, um, compare examples in English and um, non-English. 
And so the way we're showing this is um, using um, this kind of mosaic plot. So um, if you've never seen one of these before, um, on the x-axis we have our uh, factor of interest, which here is English or not English. Um, on the y-axis we have um, our two um, categories that we're comparing, so male and female. And the um, width of the bars shows you um, the numbers, how many um, it corresponds to, how many total examples we find. So um, the non-English bar is about twice as wide as the English bar. This indicates that um, the numbers in the non-English um, pool is about twice, the numbers are about twice as much as, as high as the English side. Um, and then the last thing that um, you can kind of squint at and see here is the proportions, but since proportions are, um, you need to compute those, we just give you um, those on the side. So um, in English examples, we find that um, there are 33% female arguments and the rest are male. And in non-English examples, we find 30% female arguments. So um, these are um, similar proportions, we think. They are statistically um, the same. Okay, we can also break this down by journal um, and try to compare across journals and um, identify trends. And really what we find here is that um, the numbers we find are very consistent across the three journals. So some of the counts are different. So you can see that in natural language and linguistic theory on the right, um, there are generally more examples um, than or more examples with human gendered arguments than in linguistic inquiry or than in language. But nonetheless, the proportions that we find are um, strikingly similar. So 32 or 31% female arguments and the rest being male. Um, and this is, um, this is convenient in that it's going to allow us to collapse our data and show you um, numbers that consist of um, data from all three journals since they exhibit the same behavior. So throughout for the rest of this talk, we will show you data that um, collapses information from across the three journals. Okay, um, so we can talk about grammatical function next. So um, we can compare um, subjects and non-subjects or objects um, with respect to whether they are um, male or female. And um, so I think it's um, maybe most convenient to just look at the proportions at the bottom there. Um, what we find is that 83% of male arguments are subjects and 79% of female arguments are subjects. So um, a bit uh, fewer female sub arguments or female subjects than male subjects. Not a huge difference, uh, but a bit of a difference. Okay. Um, we can also look at um, thematic roles. So um, if you're not familiar with those, I know that fewer people are familiar with those than with the concept of subjects and objects. Um, those correspond to um, semantic roles. I think that's, that's a good way of putting it. So it's, it's trying to describe what the argument is doing in, in the sentence. So is it um, being active and, and um, you know, initiating an action or is it um, experiencing an action uh, or experiencing an emotion, for example, so if you, uh, fear something, the world isn't changing, but something internally inside of you is changing. Um, if you're a patient, then um, you're being acted upon. If you're a recipient, then, then you're receiving something. Um, so we can see that um, there are more agents than other roles. This, is, uh, this kind of makes sense. Um, subjects, um, so agents and experiencers normally will be subjects. This, this correspondence isn't perfect, but um, it is um, at least consistent. So more agents than um, other roles, but you can see that the agents and the experiencers, so the roles that correspond most often to, um, to the grammatical role of subject, those um, are, have 30% female arguments and the rest are male. Um, when you look at patients, um, you see a, an increase in female arguments, so now 35%, um, and recipient all the way on the right, um, you can see by the fact that the bar itself is really thin that the numbers are quite small. Um, and I apologize for maybe the number being slightly hard to read. Um, but the proportion, which you can see on the right there, um, is now 42% female. 
So um, again, an increase in the proportion of female arguments in these um, you know, less active and these acted upon type of roles. Okay, um, let's talk about some lexical choices in our example sentences. So on the left, we can um, ask whether there is a difference in proportions of um, names. So do men or me women have more names than the other um, gender we're looking at? And the answer here is no. So you can see on the left that um, generally there are um, quite a lot of names in example sentences, but in terms of proportions, they are the same across um, male and female. So 59% of men, 58% of women, um, have proper names in, in example sentences. Um, on the right, we ask about pronouns. Um, so this graph is breaking out um, pronouns from non-pronouns. Um, and what we're seeing is that um, male arguments have pronouns associated with them 29% um, of the time. Uh, women or female arguments have pronouns associated with them 23% of the time. Um, we think this is generally probably attributive, attributable to the fact that um, there are more male subjects than female subjects and likely a pronoun, if it's going to exist, is going to be um, a subject more often than a non-subject. So this, we think, is just a byproduct of um, the general tendency to have more subjects that are male in example sentences. Okay. Uh, more about names. So we can um, look at the top most common names in example sentences. So we have the top most frequent male names on the left and the top most frequent female names on the right. Um, and you can notice that they are um, not diverse. Right? So um, in the top five male names, we have um, John and Juan, but really John, you know, John is dominating everything else. Um, on the right side for female argument names, we find uh, Mary, Maria, and Marie, right? So um, again, choices that are fairly um, limited. Um, of the over 10,000 names that we identified in this study, um, 428 were classified as non-gendered or ambiguously gendered. So this is just 4% of the data. Um, we don't feel confident saying very much about numbers that are that small compared to the totals, um, but I think it's interesting that this is these are the choices that we're making. Okay, um, more on specific um, lexical choices. So we can look at examples that um, describe occupation. So you know, professor, teacher, um, banker, uh, secretary, and so on. Um, and here we find that. Men are overrepresented in these examples, even given the total two to one ratio that we find in the overall um, sample. So the overall sample would suggest we should find 66 or 67 percent female um, male arguments here. We find 74 percent male arguments here. Um, looking at violence, um, males are now significantly overrepresented in these examples. So 84% of all arguments in violence-related examples are men. Um, and now we're interested in bre breaking those out according to uh, whether the um, argument is a subject, so probably inflicting the violence, or a non-subject, so the, um, the being acted upon a, um, object or argument in the sentence. And what we find is that women are um, subjects of violence-related sentences 68% of the time. Um, men are subjects 72% of the time. So um, again, a um, slight skew toward uh, males being subjects more often. Okay, next two slides are going to show you um, data where women are going to be overrepresented. So the first one we're interested in is um, what we call romance-related examples. So, um, you know, uh, kissing, hugging, um, liking, loving, those kinds of things. Um, and here we find that only 50% of all of our sample is uh, male arguments. Right? And given the two to one skew that we generally find, this suggests that women are overrepresented in these examples, right? We should not find uh, 50, just 50%, we should find 
male arguments if there was no skew. Okay. Um, and then it becomes even more interesting when we break things out by subject or non-subject. Uh, we find that women are subjects of these actions, of these sentences, 58% uh, of the time. Men are subjects 76% of the time, right? So in addition to this cue of just having more women generally in these examples, it's even more likely that they will be um, acted upon non-subjects than otherwise. All right, this is the part of the talk where I start to lose my voice, so I'm going to mute myself and cough in a, uh, once in a while and apologize for that. All right, so um, last thing about um, lexical choices. Um, well, one more thing um, to do with lexical choices that we want to show you has to do with kinship terms. Um, now we find that women are um, massively overrepresented in these examples. So these are only 44% male. And again, just to remind you, we would expect 67% male if there was no skew. Um, so I think, I think this is quite striking. So uh, when women are going to be chosen more often than um, otherwise in the sample, it's most likely for them that they will be uh, someone's mother, someone's wife, someone's daughter, and so on. Okay. Um, next thing I want to show you is um, sentiment analysis. So this is where we go into um, methods that are not just counting, but um, do um, something more, a bit of an analysis. Um, and in particular, um, here what we're doing is um, using two existing packages, um, one in this slide and one in the next, that automatically categorize um, predicates, verbs, into um, types of emotion. And then we can do the same kinds of counts um, on these sentences as we were doing before. So specifically, the Bing method is just going to categorize emotion into positive or negative. So in general, a uh, verb or a predicate in a sentence could either be positive or it could be negative, or it could be neither, in which case it's going to be discarded from, um, from this analysis. right? So this is why these numbers look much lower than the overall numbers that we were looking at um, throughout uh, the rest of this talk. Um, but generally what we find is for predicates that were categorized as either positive or negative, there is a skew toward being more negative for male arguments and a skew being toward being more positive for female arguments. Right, so 2.221 general skew, um, 2.5 to 1 for negative emotions, 1.7 to 1 for positive emotions. Okay, um, the NRC method um, categorizes predicates into more fine-grained categories. So, um, and those are listed over um, on the y-axis in this graph. So we get anger, fear, negative, general negative, uh, sadness, disgust, surprise, positive, or so general positive, uh, trust, anticipation, and joy. So these are the categories of interest. And again, if a predicate doesn't fall into any of these, then it's just excluded from this particular um, study or from this particular analysis. The uh, black bar there shows you the 2.2 to 1 ratio. So anything to the right of that skews male beyond the general skew that we find. And anything to the left of that is uh, skews female beyond the general skew that we find. And so um, again, what we find is, is fairly consistent, right? So the all of the negative emotions seem to be skewing male to some degree. Surprise is um, kind of not skewed and anything else is skewed female. Okay, um, so this is the part of the day where I um, read a few examples. Uh, we've selected quite a few, it's, it's, it's hard to uh, pick just a few, um, but I do want to point out um, as they read these that um, our goal is never to just um, point out just a few or to uh, make fun of anyone in particular or to call out any, any author. And what we're showing you is um, also not cherry-picked phrases, it's going to be um, a um, illustration of something that is very general. Okay, so um, here are some examples. All right, so um, which Nobel Prize winning author came in his car? Um, at least one student of every professor is horrified at his grading policy. No linguist here recommended some of his own books, 
but I don't know which of his own books, an example of um, some complex uh, sluicing, ellipsis type example, um, but suggesting that linguists are uh, men. Uh, Mary, being dumb, needs to sit down. Um, Ray's mother thinks he is a genius. Um, Oyama's sister-in-law knitted a scarf. Um, right. There's more. So I'm um, going to show you kind of another um, bunch of examples on the next slide, um, just to kind of drive home the point that this is uh, quite a general thing. So um, John ate the meal and Mary cleaned the dishes. John didn't eat the meal because he would have had to clean the dishes. Um, those are from the same paper. John thinks that he himself is a war hero. Uh, John told Bill that Mary began to cry without any reason. Kelly broke again tonight when she did the dishes. Um, for whom do you regret that she made a cake? Um, yeah. Again, um, I think I, I, want, I do want to point out that what we're seeing is stereotypes, not just of women, but of men as well, right? So um, this is a property that um, doesn't single out to just one gender for this treatment of uh, picking stereotypes. It's quite general. So um, kind of summing up and showing you a slide that looks kind of like what we saw before, um, because, you know, it's what we saw before is, is kind of still true today. So men appear more often as arguments in these example sentences. They appear more often as subjects and agents and experiencers. They engage in significantly more violence. They have significantly more occupations. And they exhibit more negative emotions. Whereas women are overrepresented as recipients and patients, they are overrepresented in romantic examples. They are massively overrepresented uh, uh, or over referred to using kinship terms. And they seem to exhibit more positive emotions. Um, some things um, are interesting, maybe are similar to what we find in the um, more recent textbook study than the original Macaulay and Bryce paper. So not many um, suggestive or explicit language in examples, although we do absolutely find stereotypes in, in our examples. Um, again, the language of example didn't make a difference, so this is not just an effect of um, not having access to better resources. Um, these are uh, very general choices. And we're seeing a slight increase over time in the numbers of or proportions of female arguments, um, but it seems like those are caused by an increase in non-subject female arguments, as um, instead of being um, a more general just increase in uh, across the board number of female arguments. Um, we think we can do better. We hope we can do better. Right? So um, this is what we want to spend the rest of the time today um, on. OK, um, so one thing to say is um, explicit discussions of non-binary gender identities are just entirely absent. There are other things that we could have uh, discussed that we didn't, and you can ask me about. We have thoughts about all of these. Um, for example, the use of use of non-Western names, um, how this might um, compare to corpus examples, so not constructed, but rather, um, you know, naturally occur occurring ones. Um, what we think about explicit, um, elicited examples um, in fieldwork, um, narratives. There is work to, that goes beyond what we've done already. Um, but, okay, um, in the interest of time, um, some of it I will do um, in the usual speed and some of it I may choose to skip and we can go back to if there is interest. Um, okay, but, but I, do, I do think this matters, right? So constructed example sentences are one of the main sources of data in theoretical linguistics. Um, and these examples that um, we see in these papers are cited over and over again and often divorced from the original source um, that they were given in, just treated as an example from the literature of some phenomenon. Um, and we see that they encode biases, sometimes subtle, but certainly existing ones. Um, and those get handed down to new generations of linguists, and that perpetuates the cycle. Um, in the interest of um, stating what I hope is, is obvious, um, inclusive language encourages participation from underrepresented groups, and that leads to a better community, and that leads to better science, um, at the cost of not very much um, effort. It's just a little bit of um, thoughtfulness. Um, in particular, 
one thing we can do is go beyond the familiar names. So John, Mary, Bill, and Sue. Um, think beyond the first names that come to mind when you uh, cite someone, when you invite someone to an event. Um, generally, these small actions can go a long way. And I do want to pause and say, um, this is hard. So even for, as for myself, having thought about this for a good at least five years, just uh, being engaged in this study and, and um, the other one, um, you know, John still is the first name that comes to mind for me. It's it's very ingrained, but I've trained myself to just pause and take a breath and and change the first thing that comes or move to the second thing, the next thing that comes to mind. Um, it is a bit of an effort, but I think it's worth it. Um, so this is kind of a more American-centric um, slide, but the Linguistic Society of America um, has um, tried to address some of this. Um, there are some resources um, that are relevant. Um, so in 2016, so in, 20, in, in 96, there was the first attempt to, for, at the guidelines for non-sexist usage. Um, in 2016, um, there was an effort to um, revamp these um, and change them. We're now um, working with the guidelines for, non, for inclusive language. Um, which you can find on um, the um, on the LSA website. Um, we had a panel um, that specifically addressed all of these issues, um, and just a month ago, um, Coggle, um, a committee I'm on, um, publishes these um, list these set of resources on equity and inclusive in inclusivity and linguistics. Um, if we get the time in the question period, I would really actually love to just show you what this looks like. Um, but I, I do want to just point out that there are uh, resources out there um, to help you. Um, I want to discuss a couple of objections um, explicitly here now, um, since they come up on occasion. So the first one is, um, we hear sometimes, um, you know, what you're saying is um, threatens my uh, free speech or, or constrains my creativity or feels like censorship. Right? Um, and what we want to say to that is, well, maybe, but if an example could potentially hurt someone and the content is just not relevant to illustrating a certain phenomenon that you're trying to illustrate, then you or linguists can and should find other means to illustrate the linguistic points that they're trying to make. Um, second possible objection is, you know, maybe you've convinced me that there's a problem, but it's really not clear what we can do about it. Um, and yes, that's true, it's, it's hard and it's probably multifaceted and complex, um, but we would welcome any effort to reverse the skews that we're seeing and to present linguistic examples in a way that celebrates and honors the diversity of individuals representing our field. So um, really, I, I'll give some specific examples of what you can do, but any small action is going to be a, start toward, a step toward improving this. Um, so in the interest of being uh, clear, um, so for one, stereotypical language and sexually explicit and demeaning language, um, language that reflects biases, um, can be avoided and should be avoided. Um, the use of gendered lexical items, so like congressman or he as a uh, so-called um, you know, inclusive or um, non-gendered pronoun, um, that's unnecessary and could be avoided. Um, and the biased and elevated frequency of particular gendered NPs and particular syntactic positions and semantic roles should be diminished. So this is a way of saying um, there is no particular reason why, why men needs to, need to be subjects more often and women need to be non-subjects more often. So this is something that we can fix. Um, embrace singular they. Right? Um, we, we do um, hear sometimes that um, the male pronoun is said to be um, um, the correct choice for singular nouns whose gender is not known. Um, but even if technically, you know, you think this is correct, um, it, it feels exclusionary of anyone who's not a man. Um, ask the non-men in your life if you're not sure. Um, I can tell you from my experience that um, I don't feel particularly included by uh, the, the he pronoun. Um, and then on the other hand, good news is that singular they has been around for decades uh, precisely for this purpose, um, and we should use it. Um, this is the part that I will um, just kind of say, and I will skip the next two slides. Um, we do recognize that this is not special to linguistics, so we didn't invent this particular type of skew and this particular way of thinking. Um, it is a very general societal trend. It starts very early. It is very entrenched. Um, but just because that is the case doesn't mean that we have to um, repeat it in our scientific field of study. Um, we 
can in fact choose to not do that. Um, so I'm gonna skip these uh, few slides. We can, uh, you can ask me about them, but they just show um, a particular studies that uh, illustrate just how endemic and uh, entrenched it is. But okay, so this is my last slide. So what can you do specifically? Well, if you're an instructor, you can choose your examples carefully. You can be sensitive to how you portray all individuals in your examples, and you can keep in mind that you're in a position of authority, and you can have a positive inf influence on young minds um, that are entering the field. You can also think about gender ratios and uh, representations in your syllabi, so who do you teach, basically. Um, if you're an author, you can be thorough and inclusive and balanced in your citations. Right? You can uh, choose not to perpetuate bias in your examples um, that you construct and that you cite. Um, you can keep the guidelines for inclusive language in mind when you write. If you're an editor or a writer, you can pay attention to the examples in the language that authors use, and you can comment on that in your reviews or in your um, decisions. If you're a conference organizer, I hope that you will uh, check out the real guidebook um, too, um, which is, um, again, resource for, resources for equity and inclusivity in linguistics um, that give very specific um, ideas for how you can be more inclusive when you organize a conference. And with that, um, I will thank the audience and this big list of individuals who've helped us over the years, and I will be uh, happy to take your questions. Thank you so much. That was very clear and uh, really interesting patterns, both to see what has changed and, of course, what hasn't changed. And appreciate the emphasis on you know, the immediate impact of, on this on people who are learning about linguistics, as this can be a very contentious and politicized issue that so people can, of course, have strong feelings about, but I think it's a, it's a good way to build consensus and motivation is just thinking about those people who are trying to enter into the field and what what the more immediate impact is on them We've got several questions about uh, methodology in the chat already and some responses from your uh, co authors. So uh, I'll read off some of these questions and if it's your question and, and you would like to uh, read it off or articulate it uh, for yourself feel free to raise your hand or uh, start your video or microphone let me know. Um, so there's a question from Annie who was wondering if Misogyny noir has been investigated in this study, and there's a response from Chris on generally the difficulties of uh, looking at race in any way in this kind of a study because it's not, you know, a grammatical feature in many languages. Do you have any comments on uh, issues of race that intersect with some of the issues that you've addressed in this presentation? So I, I, the main thing to say about that is that the the numbers of arguments that we can identify as being racially non-white are. Um, small, very small. So um, really the only way we can identify uh, race is, is through names, I think. Um, and because it's not a grammatical feature and um, you don't see agreement, for example. Um, and again, the you saw the slide with names, the choices of names are just very Eurocentric and white sounding. So um, while I, I, I agree this is very interesting, it's just um, hard to see how this particular sample can um, help us shed light on that question. Uh, and then there's a question from uh, Peter Austin asking about the correlation between the gender of the authors and the distribution of gender in their example. So Chris uh, Geisler did say that that's something you've looked at uh, and could chat about. So I don't know if you or Chris want to respond to that question in more detail. I would leave uh, uh, Hadas, uh, if, you, if you've got that. Um, the we we did um, we do have a section about that in a paper of this and in other versions of this talk. I don't know if you have a pocket slide about that. I do not have a pocket slide, though I probably should have prepared one because I've been asked this before, but uh, I did not come prepared. Um, so you will see me now flounder for a moment as I try to find the paper. Um, I can fill in a stat in the meantime while you're doing that. <laughs> you don't mind me jumping in. It was really similar. So it was something like 30 uh, male authors um, or something like 36 percent uh, had 36% female pronoun, uh, sorry, uh, arguments and female authors were, or sorry, 32 to 36. So female authors used very slightly more female arguments, but not much more. It was very similar to the overall ratio. So I think this is the graph that we want to be looking at. Ricker, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, and oh, your, so your screen is not shared right now. No, that is, that is a good point. That is a very good point. Um, you're right. So let me share my screen uh, for a moment because I forgot I stopped sharing. Um, here's here's the graph. Um, 
That's the one, right, from Bricker? I think this is the one. So, yeah. um, so okay, first thing to say is uh, we manually classified um, authors um, by gender um, based on based on their names, which is 100% imperfect. And I want to um, acknowledge that. Um, with that, um, we're looking at the ratios of female arguments, male arguments, and non-gendered arguments um, across female authors and male authors. And um, the ratios themselves are um, quite similar. Um, Ricker, can you repeat what the ratios were just now, now that we're looking at the graph? Um, I think what you see here is- Yeah, is, I think it works out something like 35.7% uh, female arguments from female authors and 31 or 32% from male authors. So not, not very different. Yeah. So yeah, I think the main thing that you can see here that maybe is, is interesting is that is the, the comparison between the um, red bar, the one on the left uh, of the three and the green one, which is the one on the right. Um, so for, for male authors, these are basically the same. These are, you know, choice of female arguments and choice of non-gendered arguments uh, seem to be kind of same proportion. Whereas female argument or female authors choose uh, uh, more female arguments, um, but just to some, to some degree, not the, just to some degree, put it that way. And I think that's possibly the most interesting um, aspect of this particular graph. Um, I do and believe that statistically the numbers were not were not different. And the we tried looking at this in a couple of different angles in terms of how to handle co-authorship and first author and single author versus multiple authors and didn't seem to be um, substantially different as I recall. Right. I'm going to uh, stop sharing again. Yeah. Right. We got another question from Julia Salabank who brought up the issue you alluded to of uh, using constructed examples versus uh, corpus examples. So she asked, why is there still such reliance on constructed sentences? Why not use data from corpora of, da of language in use? It would be interesting to see to what extent these would reproduce bias. And so there's a bit of a response in the chat from Chris and from Ricker, uh, as well as a comment from Peter Austin. So I don't know if any of you want to elaborate on that point. So I feel like at a disadvantage, I'm the only one who's probably not at the chat. <laughs> so um... I, can, I can recap what I said, I guess. So this is a, a great question. So, um, and of course, this is this was part of our, you know, research question from the start, really. And so we had other journals and we're trying to, you know, figure out what we can extract. And so part of it is a methodological limitation. Um, there's just something about, you know, the way that we present these constructive sentences, which makes them easy to um, extract and gather a lot of data to then hire undergraduates to analyze. Um, the, the nature of corpus data is that it's, people don't really speak in complete sentences. And so that created a, a very lo difficult logistical barrier um, to just building a data set. So super interested in the question. There's partially logistical reasons that we ultimately, basically there was just so much less data that we could identify automatically that we didn't feel like we could compare the two data sets head to head in a way that we could say corpus behaves like this, constructed behaves like that. And I think one other thing to add there, if I remember correctly, is that a lot of examples were first and second person arguments. So there were just significantly fewer third person arguments, even once you identified sentences and were able to chunk them up into um, out of conversations and into what we might think of as individual sentences. There was generally just an order of magnitude less data than in these other um, journals that we were looking at. Great, thanks. I um, had another uh, question from uh, Myla or Mila. Uh, was asking, are there any existing studies on gender representation in various language teaching books? I'm afraid the results might be similar. So there is a study specifically looking at, um, Span uh, uh, at Spanish. There are some studies looking specifically at English instruction. Um, there is a study looking at French uh, journals. They all find the same. They all find the same kinds of findings. So yes, I think this is probably quite a general, uh, fact, a general fact. Yeah. Um, and another question from Sila or Sila, asking if, uh, yeah, if the writers of the textbooks have some particular reason in continuing to construct such biased language in the textbook. So what are the possible factors you may think of? I'm assuming we're, we're thinking some of this is unconscious, but. Uh, it, what's the bigger picture here, or do you not want to get into a, a social analysis of why this, why these disparities exist? I, I don't think that I want to attribute motives to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, I do think that um, 
we could guess at some things. So for one, um, we, as we were saying, this is a part of a larger societal trend. I apologize for the cat being loud. Um, so this is a part of a larger societal trend. So, um, you know, if you were to just go with what comes to mind and you were following the, the kind of general things you think about, um, about individuals and in, in kind of standard context, you might be more inclined to think about a male argument than a female argument or um, something that's more stereotypical. Um, and you might also not have realized that you're doing it. I think it's, it's very likely that um, this is not, I don't think this is conscious. I think I want to say that. So, um, and in particular, this is, I, I flagged at some point that in the more, in the newer studies, we're not seeing um, sexually explicit um, and suggestive language. And I think this is important because um, one way to interpret that is that um, at some point um, around maybe the aughts, we had identified, the field had identified that um, there is some issue with the way example sentences are constructed. Um, and this is, um, this is like the glaring thing, right? So those examples are uh, kind of the most egregious. And so um, you can go in and just fix those and remove those. And once you've done that, um, you've improved things in some way, but you've also just obstruct, obscured the view. You've made it much harder to find and identify now that there's an issue. So now you need to have the kind of study that we were doing to show you that while any one individual example maybe is okay, um, or the majority are, um, on the whole, we still have an issue. So, um, yeah, speculating here, right? We don't know why. Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would echo the idea that this is unconscious, especially you just think of how much work it is to to actually write these. And so we're, we're just analyzing what somebody, you know, poured hours of study into trying to construct an example to explain a very abstract concept in a clear way. So the last thing that was on their mind was which gender pronoun did I use? And so then, you know, these unconscious biases are going to come out just because there's so much mental energy, I think, being, being poured elsewhere. So as an answer to Peter Austin's qu uh, comment in the chat, um, once we started doing this study um, and presenting it, um, there has been, I think, increased interest in, um, in improving. So in particular, I'm aware of two authors of textbooks that went in and so one of them had, were at the point of, had, they had finished a draft and it wasn't published yet, gone in and hired uh, someone to, an, a student to, to do this kind of analysis and target and improve the ratios of arguments in their, in their example sentences. And the second author of a published textbook um, that um, is interested in doing this for the next um, edition of their textbook. So, um, so yes, hopefully this will actually change something in the field. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that does make sense. I kind of, you need help to do this. It's kind of hard to do it on your own as an author. Um, I think we're going to leave it there with our questions. We're now over an hour, and I've seen some people have, have had to go already. But let me say thank you again to Haras and to uh, Chris and to Riker, who have been here helping with some questions as well, and to those who have worked with you in collaborating uh, and bringing these uh, issues to our attention for reflection and hopefully changing some of our practices in linguistics and making it a, a better field for everyone. And thank you to Sarah, too, who's here and oh, yeah. uh, in the background answering questions. Yes, great. Thank you. All right, All right, thank, thank you everyone for joining us. Patient, thank you for the questions. I appreciate your time. All right. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. <laughs>